Hello everybody, welcome to this uh, Hangout with Sun. We have uh, a pleasure to have the Google Science Fair uh, winner with us uh, today. So we'll be talking a little bit about uh, CERN, accelerators, and uh, health uh, physics that is also done here, and uh, answer all your uh, questions. So maybe we can get started with a brief introduction of CERN. So we have uh, the largest uh, particle physics laboratory. We are located just close to uh, Geneva, and there are about 12,000 physicists working here, and we come from 99 different countries. So try to imagine the number of languages you can hear at the cafeteria. So all these people, we're here for only one single thing. We want to know what matter is made of. So all these people have one common goal, and it's to understand how it all works, what are the smallest uh, building blocks of matter, and how they interact with each other. So for that, we have this huge accelerator. And uh, we are uh, right there, downtown Europe. And we have this huge accelerator, which is 27 kilometers uh, around, with four. Uh, the accelerator is, in fact, 100 meters underground. So we have a picture of it behind us right now. So it gives you an idea. It's like a, a subway tunnel being dug, 100 meter underground. We have four big shafts, access shafts, with caverns where four large experiments are being built. Are built. So we have the accelerators that produces collisions of pro protons and protons. And then at the, ex at the different uh, detectors, we just detect what's coming out. And we're trying to study what comes out of it to better understand what matter is made of. So there is a Mirko power uh, fire. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Sorry, Mirko. Mirko is with me. Mirko is uh, one of the accelerator physicists here, and he will be uh, telling you a bit more about the accelerators. Yes, OK, thank you. So indeed, the, the accelerator is 27 kilometer long, and 100 meter underground. There is a main essential reason why it is uh, so deep in the, in, in the Earth, not because we want to uh, hide something, but because 100 meter underground, there is a very solid um, background for the for our machine to be to be installed. It was installed there already since the time of LEP. The tunnel was already built uh, uh, more than uh, 20 years, uh, 30 years ago, and uh, so it constitutes a very solid background for uh, for our magnet to be installed and for uh, for the particles to run inside the inside the magnet. In fact, we uh, you have to think about the the stability of the beams that are separating inside the machine. Uh, we want to uh, have the beams very stable all along the ring with a precision of 100 to 100 micrometers. Imagine to have, su to have such a machine on surface and imagine to have a truck passing by. The vibration from a, from a truck on the road would be really enough to destroy, to burst up our experiment. And so it is clear that 100 meters underground, the machine is quite uh, more stable and we can run there our, our experiments. There are, of course, other reasons, but uh, this is the, the, the main one. Uh, if we if we look on the uh, at the scheme uh, showing the complex of accelerator at CERN, the LHC, in fact, it's only the last ring of a, a long chain of of, acceler of acceleration. In fact, our particles are first produced the protons that we normally accelerate in the LHC are first produced from a bottle of hydrogen. The hydrogen is the simple gas in nature, and separating the hydrogen from the electron that is, uh, that is um, the, um, the proton from the electron that is uh, turning around the, uh, the nucleus. Separating them, we are left only with the protons that are then accelerating in a long path. First of all, in a linear accelerator, which is uh, marked there as LINAC2. Uh, then they enter in a first circular machine, which is the booster. They are further accelerated. They are then extracted to the PS, the proton synchrotron, Accelerated again and then extracted to the SPS, the seven kilometers long ring, which was as well shown on the previous on the previous image. Kate, if you can uh, if you can just show it, just to just to see the dimension of it. Uh, yeah, it's the seven kilometer ring, which is which is shown there, just to have a comparison, visual comparison between the LHC and the SPS. And then after a further acceleration, they are extracted in, in both directions into the LHC on uh, clockwise side and anti-clockwise uh, anti side. In this, uh, in this way, we are left with bunches of particles, really packets of particles. Uh, and we, we, um, we normally fill the rings uh, with 2,800 packets of particles in one direction and 2,800 packets of particles in the, in the other direction. And each, and each packet contains 
150 billions of particles of protons, and so we, we have the ring full of these packets and uh, these particles that are further accelerating to, in, uh, in the LHC, uh, and then once they are at the proper uh, energy and they are uh, really set up uh, to, um, to the optimum, they, they are made to collide inside the experiments and we have those beautiful images that uh, all of you have seen on the on the web, or the explosions. I, this is one uh, one of the of the cases, in fact. And we have uh, then the experiments collecting data and eventually discovering uh, new particles and being all the secrets of uh, of, uh, of nature. And, uh, and so it is right from here that the the Higgs boson was discovered uh, in. Um, in, uh, uh, in, in, in this year. Um, uh, uh, we were, um, I, I was speaking about the number of particles. I, I would like to mention just uh, um, uh, well, the, uh, we accelerate normal, the, normally the particles. We have been accelerating in the past three years the particles to 3.5 TV or 4 TV. The nominal design energy of the LHC is 7 TV, just to give you a flavor of how much uh, it is. The beams of the LHC at 7 TV uh, will have an energy which is uh, almost the same as the kinetic energy, the energy of movement of a big, big aircraft, uh, aircraft landing. Imagine a 747 landing at, at uh, 150 kilometers per hour, smashing against the wall. It's me. <laughs> this is this is really this gives you the idea of the huge uh, energy uh, which is uh, which is containing this particle, and also tells you how dangerous these beams are for, com for the components of the machine. Uh, in fact, if we lose control, I told you earlier that you want to control the, the trajectory of the particles with a precision of 100, 200 micrometers. If we lose control of the, uh, of the beams and they go out of the pipe where, where they are con contained, I don't know, well, we don't see here, but the pipe, the two pipes which are inside the chain of magnets, ah, you see there indeed, uh, the beams uh, which are contained inside those pipes which are only um, 50, 50 millimeters uh, in, in diameter, uh, if we lose control of them, they may go oh, on the border of, the pi of, of these pipes, damaging them, them. No. even if we lose control of them, they, they may drill a, really a hole in one of these magnets. Of course, there is, a, there is no issue for people outside. We are 100 meters underground, so they, all the particles will be stopped before uh, reaching the surface. By the way, this means that the protection as well of, the, of all the components of the machine is, is a very important issue. We have a series of interlock, a series of automatic protections that as soon as, for example, we lose control of the particle, we see that they are deviating too much from the ideal trajectory. The beam is Im immediately cut out, extracted from the machine, and all the components are, are then safe for any, for any possible uh, incident. I think uh, for the moment it's... Uh, yeah, let's go to Piotr. Piotr is uh, at one of those caverns that I was uh, mentioning earlier. Piotr is a physicist on the CMS experiment, one of the two large uh, experiments at CERN uh, on the LHC, very uh, uh, multi-purpose uh, experiment. Piotr, maybe you can uh, tell us uh, about the environment where you are right now. Okay. Uh, so I'm not going to tell you about uh, anything, any planes destroying anything, because here nothing can destroy anything, nothing can go wrong. We only have the world's most powerful magnet here, and that's basically it. So I'm, I'm in the cavern of the CMS detector, one of the big detectors that we use to see what happens to the collisions of particles. So when you, when you take the two beams of particles and collide, uh, this happens, by the way, 40 million times per second. We collide particles together, and there, in all directions, particles produced from this collision will spray in all directions. So what we want to do is uh, we want to take this place where the particles collide and build something around it so that we... Uh, is this sound okay? Well, you could move it closer to your mouth. I think that would okay. be better. I will, I will hold the microphone right here. Okay, and it? shout a little bit, yeah, so everybody yeah. hears you clearly. Uh, unfortunately, your... unfortunately we, have, we have a huge background noise in here. There's all this ventilation and cooling systems which make it a very noisy environment. So I'll try it like this. I hope I'm not distorting too much. Uh, so what we do is we take the, the, the point where the collision happens and build something around it.
to uh, track, measure all the particles that get produced in the collisions. And this is the, the CMS experiment. We're, we're now underground, 100 meters underground, under France, uh, in one of the points where the two beams from the LHC accelerator collide. And what you can see behind me is uh, part of the, of the CMS detector. Now, the part because uh, it's impossible to get it on camera uh, from, from where I'm standing or sitting, actually. I can try to sort of give you a look around. So uh, you, can see, you can see a hole a hole in this big circular structure. CMS is basically a cylinder, a cylinder that's uh, 24 meters in length, 14 meters in diameter, and it weighs 14,000 metric tons, or 14 million kilograms. So it's, 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 one of, it's actually the heaviest detector we have here. And this huge cylinder surrounds the point where you collide, where the particle collisions happen. So that all the particles that get, get produced, they have to traverse this cylinder and either get tracked as they pass through the cylinder or they get stuck inside somewhere in the various layers of detectors that we have. And as they get stuck, we measure their properties. We measure their energies, we measure their momenta. And from that, we try to disentangle the information about what happened in the collision. So we take the debris from the collision, the particles that spray in all directions from the collision, measure them as precisely as we can to identify what happened in, in the very collision itself of, of the two protons. And there we look for something uh, either that, that we expect or, or we look for something that we don't expect. So we were expecting to, to find uh, the Higgs boson, and we did find it. And now we're hoping to find something that we weren't expecting, which would be uh, even more exciting. Thanks, uh, Piotr, for uh, giving us a view of the beautiful CMS detector. That's quite impressive. Maybe there are some uh, questions from the students that uh, we could answer right now, for those of you who don't mind being in front of the camera. No, you just need to unmute. Yeah, now you need to unmute. That's true. <laughs> <coughs> so there are, we are... Uh, can, can you hear me on your end? Okay, I'm going to Yes, yes we're good. Just hear you. All right, what, what, anyone, uh, I have one question. When you're, when you're building such a structure, something that's never in history been created in such a scale, where do you even begin? <laughs> okay, how do we begin to uh, design that? Uh, yeah, do you want to answer? I can answer it too. I, I can say, we, we just, we just, you just have to mute, Ariel, you have to mute, you just, uh, otherwise we get the echo again. Oh yeah, okay, it's, it's okay now. So, huh, where do you begin? Well, it actually, it's, it's in a way simple. You start from the, from the big sort of overview and then you just work out the details. So, a, a particle detector like this is basically, consists of uh, two things. One thing is the collision itself that you want to measure, and the second thing is the, the detector that you built around it. So you have to have the collision, and then you have to build around the collision a structure that will allow you to, to detect the particles. Now we know from experience that in order to uh, measure the properties of the particles, uh, many of the properties we get by analyzing how they're bent in a magnetic field. We put them in a very, very strong magnetic field, as they, as they travel through this magnetic field, they get bent. Depending on whether they're positively or negatively charged, they're, they're bent uh, one way or another. Depending on their energy, they get bent more or less. The, the, the low energy particles get bent, get bent a lot, and the, the high energy particles travel, travel nearly straight. So we want to put a magnetic field around this collision point somehow, and then when we have the magnetic field, you need to put layers of different detectors that detect the particles, that by, by one way or another measure their properties. So where do you begin constructing something like this? This, this is a journey that actually begins, for, for CMS, this, this began about 30 years ago. So this is, a, this is a project that has a very, very long lifetime. It's about uh, as old as I am, roughly. Uh, so the, 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 basic, the basic concept is, uh, you just have to arrange your magnet. You have to think of how do you arrange your magnetic field, and how do you arrange your detectors. Do you make a huge detector 
with a strong field or maybe try to make it small, a compact, with a higher field or with a lower field? Do you, do you, do you have a solenoid that generates this field or something else? So you just, you just have sort of the basic overview of how you want to build it. And then you fill it in. You say, OK, so we need a tracking detector. What technology do we try to base it on? And then you say, OK, this, this thing is going to probably be ready 20 years from now. So we have to imagine the technology you're going to have 20 years from now and try to make an educated guess as to what precision you're going to be able to achieve and how do you want to, to try and build it. And then as time goes by, the different details are being worked out. This is all being passed to engineers who, who, who design mechanically so that it, it's actually something that doesn't collapse when you put it together, things like that. The physicists give input. How precisely do they want to measure the different properties of the particles? So how strong the magnetic field needs to be? How precise needs to be the position resolution of the detectors? This, this I can actually I can give you, a, a, while, while I'm, I'm answering the question, I can sneak in a fun fact. If you look at the detector behind me, you can see in, in, in the red section, you can see gray, gray elements. These are chambers that measure the passing. Uh, I'm trying to point my finger in the correct place while looking at the camera. Hold, bear with me. Uh, yeah, it's like that. So the muon produced in the detector fly, fly from the center of the detector, somewhere here, outwards, like that. And as they fly, we want to measure their, we want to measure their trajectory with a precision of uh, about the th equivalent to the thickness of a human hair, more or less. OK, this is how precisely we want to measure where each particle has passed when it's passing the detector. Uh, this gives us the, 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 physics, the, the physics performance that we need in the end. So on the scale of 14 meters, where, which is the scale of, which is the size of the detector, you need to locate everything up to the thickness of a human hair, more or less. One, uh, about one-tenth of a millimeter. So this is one of the things that, 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 that this, this is what we know now. You know, so one thing could add to that, uh, Piotr, is that, uh, in fact, we st the very st first step is to see we get, we are experimental physicists, but we get information from theoretical physicists. They are there thinking of what could be there, new particles, new theories, new things that we haven't found yet. And they tell us more or less what kind of properties these things could have. Then it's our job to, to design apparatus, detectors, like the one that, um, everything that uh, Piotr described, to give us the answers that we are needing. So if we want to measure particles that have electric charges, then we will put detectors that are there to measure the uh, electric charges. If we want to measure events with a lot of uh, tracks in them, we will make sure that we can do that with a high precision. And so we, we're trying to get to very few millimeters out to 14, 20, 30 meters away from the collision uh, point. So that gives us all the information. And an additional element, maybe from, uh, from the machine side, from the accelerator side, um, thinking also about the future. We are, we are now working with the LHC, but we are thinking to a new accelerator that should be built in, let's say, in the 30s. And it is a new machine which will be something between 80 and 100 kilometers long. So uh, according to the, uh, to, the, to, the, to the theories, we need a, a more powerful machine to see what is behind the, the exposure and, uh, and to discover to a new, the new, um, let's say, new particles or whatever. New, we, knew, uh, we know um, we need a new machine which is more powerful. And to be more powerful, it needs to be larger and even uh, with more powerful magnets. And this is the machine of the future, uh, the FCC, as somebody call it, or another kind of ma a machine that we are already studying. So now that we are working with the LEC, and now that the LEC is a reality, we are already thinking to the, machine, the machines of the future. But in fact, several uh, projects that are, uh, that, are, that are on paper and will become reality, hopefully, in the coming years. Maybe it's a good time to take another question. Uh, don't forget to unmute uh, and be mute. And hold it up to your mouth. Go ahead. So what uh, type of things that you're picking up? Yeah. Or is there something specific that you use? 
We didn't hear anything. Uh, right here. Okay. Uh, uh, I need to get some more Okay. 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 So, what elements do you guys use in the particle accelerator? Can you just use any atom? Or okay. any no, we don't hear you. Let me be fair. Yes. Ariel, you need to be fair. Can you hear me? Repeat the question. Are you, are you able to hear me? Yes. Yeah. We hear you. Okay, so let's try the question again. All right. So what type of element do you use in the particle accelerator? Does it need to be a specific type of atom that you accelerate? Or can you just no, sorry. We absolutely <laughs> need to use the particle accelerator. I heard it. I heard it. I can repeat <laughs> But we just we need to mute you guys. Go ahead. Uh, the, the question was, what type of atom must be used uh, for the accelerator? Is any type of atom, or is there a specific type of atom that must be used? You mean to be in the accelerator? Inside the beam. Well, Maybe I my, uh, can so answer as, that. I, as I said earlier, uh, well, let's say we accelerate two kinds of particles present in 2D LHC. We accelerate protons, and they are the one of the two components of the nucleus uh, uh, of the atoms. Uh, and we, f for this, we use uh, um, hydrogen in a gas form, which is then ionized, ionized, and then we separate the electrons from the protons, and we accelerate the protons. But also, we accelerate uh, lead ions. Um, which is uh, we have a, a very a small component, a small piece of uh, of very pure lead, which is then heated up. A, 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 a gas of lead is, is taken out and it is uh, stripped. I mean, it is charged, let's say, uh, positively uh, along a, a longer path, and then accelerated in the same way that I that I was speaking about earlier. In the future, we'll have uh, uh, also new kind of uh, um, of elements. We are thinking about uh, xenon. Um, and maybe other other uh, other kind of elements I'm not aware of. So these are essentially the the, the, the elements we are be, we we are using to uh, to produce the particles to be accelerated into the LHC. No questions? <laughs> Don't forget you're muted. And Ariel, uh, yeah, you might have to repeat the question again if it doesn't go. How do you detect particles that fly off the end of the detector? It's a cylinder, so what the flies off the end? No, no, you have to, uh, to speak much louder. Okay. With the microphone closer to the mouth. How do you detect the particles that fly off the ends of the cylinder? I did, I did, I did. We're sorry, we're doing our best here, but we can't hear you. I, yeah, we need your help. I, I think I got it. <laughs> Let, 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 let's check. Let's verify. So, did you ask how do I how do we detect particles that go through the ends of the cylinder? Yes, I I see you're nodding your heads. This is visual indication that uh, I have interpreted. So, okay, it's not only the cylinder. It's actually this a cylinder with covers. Okay, so the detector has both the cylindrical part, but it also also has. Uh, let me just pick up the mic. It also has covers on either side. Okay, so so we actually surround the collision point from all sides. We we sur we, sur we, sur we surround it by the cylindrical part, which we call the barrel, from the sides, and then we we also cover the front and the back too. I mean, we cannot. Piotr, yeah? you could say that it uh, it has the geometry of a tin can. So it's yeah. a cylinder with two ends. Yeah, I w I'm actually I wasn't fully aware what the cylinder with what the words cylinder actually means but I guess it means only it's sort of the, the, the cylinder without the lids so you can you can say like a can it's like a can it has both the cylindrical parts but it also has the, the two lids now from where I'm sitting with the camera you can only see the the cylindrical part but actually further down the road there's uh, there's there's the two lids that so in fact we do have particles that can escape that's the particles because we have to let the beam into the cylinder Right? We have to let the beams enter the cylinder. So if the particles from the decay 
go in the same direction, very close to the direction of the beam entering from, from one side or, or another, <coughs> these, would, these would actually escape. But uh, it turns out that these are of relatively little importance for us. What we are most interested in is the particles that go perpendicular to the, to the beam line. These, these are the ones that have carried most information about, about uh, heavy new particles. And in fact, uh, there are several sub-detectors in our detector. So they are built like you have uh, Russian dolls, you know, one inside the other. So we have several layers in the cylinder, cylindrical uh, part as well as the end caps. So we have all those layers, and each layer is there to give you us part of the information to be able to reconstruct what happened. So it looks like mini firework and happening in the center of the detector. We catch all the fragments and we try to bring them, to reconstruct it, to find what was initially created. Any, uh, maybe another question? Someone with a loud voice? <laughs> Ariel, uh, you need to unmute. Push the button. What research is currently being conducted at CMS? What research is uh, currently being conducted at CMS? So, here are you, right there the, in the heart of CMS. So, please uh, give us some clues. Okay. Uh, let me just. Ah, okay. You've muted. Ah, sorry, has been. So, in fact. Uh, let me try and show you what research is being conducted. Let's see if I can see anything from here. So this is this is more or less the research that's being conducted in CMS. It's construction research. <laughs> where what we're basically doing now is uh, thanks. Uh, we don't have so CMS is a detector to detect collisions of particles from particle beams. Now, if we had particle beams now, I wouldn't be sitting here. Or at least I wouldn't be sitting here for long. I wouldn't be talking here for long. I would be sitting here maybe I would be actually sitting here for very long. But not moving. So the reason I I'm actually in the cavern is that we don't have beams. We don't have collisions. When there's collisions, nobody can be here in this area because uh, it's it's just uh, lethal radiation. So we we have a, a two about two year break in the in the research program. And uh, at least in the collisions. So we, we don't take new data. What we're doing now is we're preparing to, to restart with, uh, with actually higher energy than we had up to now. So when we start in, in uh, what is it, about a year from now, or a year and a half? Oh, uh, a year. A year, a year. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually forgot what, what date it is today. But yeah, it's, it's, already, it's already 2014, so it's a year. Sorry about that. Uh, so when we start in about a year from now, we'll have twice as much energy as we had up to now. So we're, what we're doing now is we're preparing for that. So we're trying to study what kind of physics processes we'll be able to, to look for. We're finally finalizing the analysis of the data we took up to now. So we are actually putting out new results still. We're still analyzing data that we, we had finished collecting a year ago. This is the time that it takes to, to actually process and analyze all the data fully. So we're finishing up old analysis, and we're preparing for new analysis. So we're kind of in between. We're also upgrading the detector. We're actually putting things in or replacing things. So we're basically making the detector better to, 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 to cope with the new, to, to, to better measure the, the collisions when we, have, when we have higher energies. OK, and when we restart, there are always hundreds of experiments going on at the same time. But essentially, we're trying to understand what else is there more than what we have learned so far. We know with the Higgs boson, we have completed the theory that is called the standard model. But that only explains what, what we call now visible matter. So think of that. If you look out at the sky at night and we see tons of stars and galaxies and uh, all sorts of things out there, everything you see in the universe only accounts for 5% of what is out there. So 5% of the content of the universe is visible matter. The rest doesn't emit light, and we call it dark matter because of that. And dark matter accounts for about 27% of what the content of the universe. And the rest is 
called dark energy. So we know those things are there. We have all sorts of proof of it, but we are unable to put our hands on it yet. So we are really trying to produce dark matter particles with the LHC. That's one of the big, big things that we are trying to do. It could be in the form of something we call supersymmetric particles. So this is one type of thing that we are looking for, just to give you a flavor of what we are doing. So if uh, are there still more questions, or should we tell you a little bit more about hadron therapy? I know that many of you are in uh, biology, are biology students, and so one small part of the research that is being done at CERN is to look how those accelerators can be used for the cancer therapy. And one really, really promising technique that is already in use, in fact, as you see on the screen right now, it's uh, the GSI center, which is in, uh, this is, uh, in Heidelberg in uh, Germany. And this is a place where we do hadron therapy. So instead of zapping cancer cells using x-rays, we use, in fact, hadrons, which are simply particles made of quarks, such as, for example, protons or nuclei of carbon. So we take protons or carbons, and you can see the, the, the red curve there with a very sharp P. So what I have here on this uh, screen, on the left, uh, on the, the vertical axis, gives you the relative dose that is deposited. That is, how much energy is deposited by the x-rays. And on the horizontal axis, it shows how far in, into the human tissue this is deposited. So if we look now at the photons or the X-rays curve, that curve there, you see that it deposits most of its energy at the beginning, and then it falls off. So if you have a cancer cell or a tumor that is at that depth, say 15, 150 millimeter inside an organ, you want you would burn with the x-rays, you would burn all the healthy cells in front of it and deposit not that much energy right there. On the contrary, if you look at the red curve for the carbon or the blue curve underneath for protons, you can see that it burns, it deposits very little energy on its way there, and then it deposits a huge amount of energy right where you want. And that we can tune, we can adjust exactly the depth where we want the energy being produced. So this allows you to zap cancer cells in a much more efficient way without damaging healthy cells ahead of it. So this is called Hadron Therapy. There are now three centers in Europe, one in uh, Austria, one in Italy, and one in uh, Heidelberg in Germany. And there are more being uh, built. There was such research as well conducted at uh, Fermilab, another uh, American uh, lab where there was also particle physics being done. So those are all sort of uh, spin-offs of the type of research that we do here. The big spin-off we had, of course, at CERN is the web. So that's what we are using here. This, the web was invented at CERN because we needed, as I told you earlier, all these people from so many countries working here. We needed a mean to efficiently communicate among each other. So the research that we are doing at CERN has impact on all sorts of fields. So we have time for maybe uh, one, more a one more question, one last question. But could you just yes. ask when you but The only question we have remaining, one more, and then I have to send the students off to class, was when you describe the energy doubling, uh, for the new experiments, how exactly are you doubling the energy? How are you doing that? Mirko will answer that. So I was mentioning, uh, I was speaking in the beginning, that the design energy of the LHC is 7 TV. Uh, you have to think that the energy of a machine is directly related to the circumference of the machine itself and the magnetic field of the magnets that are confined in the particles inside the ring. So the larger the dimension of the machine, the larger the energy that you can afford, in, you, can, you, can, you can have in your machine, and also the stronger the magnetic field that confines the particle in this ring, the higher again the energy. Um, I say 7 TV is the, the energy with uh, um, uh, the design energy of the LHC, but in the past years, uh, we've been using 3.5 TV or 4 TV, 3.5 in 2010, 2011. We went up to 4 TV in um, in um, uh, in 2012, 
uh, we aim at increasing this energy, actually not doubling but adding a 50% more, we want to go up to 6.5 possibly, from 6.5 to 7 TV uh, when we resume in 2015 and, and, and later. This is done increasing the, uh, the magnetic field that is confined in the particles, uh, which allow us, of course, making particles, more regenerative particles running along, along the ring. So the diameter, of course, is not changing. It is always at 27 kilometers of the machine. We are increasing the, the, the magnetic field, and then we can pump up the energy of the particles. How the energy is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is increased inside the particles through, uh, um, a, um, let's say, a, um, a system which is called the um, RF accelerating cavities that are essentially elements that are positioned at a specific point of the machine. Once the particles are passing through, they are giving a kick to each particle, and this is not really a limitation. We could increase even more, but really the limitation is given by the magnetic field confining the particles inside the 27 kilometers ring. And it's really easy to understand. Imagine that you're on a bicycle and you want to take a very sharp turn, you know. If you're going really fast, it's really hard to take a sharp, sharp turn. So the faster you go, the harder it is to turn, take a tight turn. So with, with stronger magnets, we can force them to bend faster. So, so that's why better, we need the magnets. Pneumat pneumatics on the wheel. Uh, that's it. On the, on the bike. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you uh, for coming uh, and joining us today. It was neat uh, talking with you. Thank you very much for the time. And, uh, uh, we should uh, let you know that there is now a competition going on at CERN called a Green Line for School. And uh, any uh, student from a school from anywhere in the world, a group of students can apply to uh, come to CERN and do their uh, your own experiments. You, you will be given a real beam line, and you could be conducting your own experiment. All the uh, information is given on CERN uh, webs uh, website, cern.ch slash BL4F, beam line for school. So have a look at it. This is really a neat opportunity, and uh, we invite you all to come here. So a group of students will be invited. We'll pay all the expenses and the travel expenses for you to come to CERN and do your own experiment. And Google Science Fair also, don't forget. So one of your uh, school uh, mates uh, won last year, but uh, but uh, don't forget that that was you. Yes. And then, uh, don't forget that uh, this competition is uh, ongoing and you could register for it. So here's your chance. Very good. Thank you very much. Give them a quick hand. Thank you. Have a good evening over there. And uh, thank you very much to all of you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.